In this video, we're going to introduce the law of mass action. So in the previous video, we introduced chemical equilibrium and we talked about reversible processes and how when you uh, when you reach a point where there's no change in concentration of your reactants or products, you've reached a point of chemical equilibrium, right? And we looked at this example of NO2. We had two NO2 molecules that can dimerize and form N2O4. And we showed this little concentration versus time plot. So as the reaction progresses, NO2 is at first decreasing, N2O4 is increasing, but then they reach this point of consistency where they reach chemical equilibrium. So the question is, how do we quantify this chemical equilibrium? Is there a defining characteristic of equilibrium for any reaction? And it turns out there is, and that's governed by the law of mass action. So if we take this uh, this chemical reaction as an example, um, we know that since uh, since this process is reversible, we don't really uh, at you know standard conditions we don't really have just pure N2O4 or just pure NO2. Right? There's always going to be some mixture of them, but it turns out that there is a constant. Um, it, that uh, relating the concentrations in a particular way results in a constant that is defining of this reaction, right? So that ratio is going to be the concentration of N2O4 over the concentration of NO2 squared. And this uh, exponent here comes from the stoichiometric coefficient, right? So we have a stoichiometric coefficient of two here. So we have this exponent of two in the denominator. And this is what's known as the equilibrium constant. And we use the variable capital K to denote the equilibrium constant. So this is the equilibrium constant. So this ratio of the concentrations is actually going to be a constant that is uh, indicative of every single chemical reaction, right? So now if we want to use this for generalized chemical reactions, then we need to, to generalize this form, right? So let's take the following chemical reaction, right? So let's say we have just some general, um, some general reactant A with some stoichiometric coefficient little a, B in a reversible reaction that produces some product C plus some product D. So the lowercase letters are representative of the stoichiometric coefficients. Um, consistent with the law of mass action, if we want to denote the equilibrium constant for this reaction, we would write it out in the following way. So we have the concentration of C raised to the C power, oh, times the concentration of D raised to the little d power over the concentration of A raised to the little a power times concentration of B raised to the little b power, right? So what we have here is uh, a product of the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants, right? With each one raised to its respective stoichiometric coefficient, right? So basically here we've set up a general formula for calculating this equilibrium constant for any general reaction. Now, because we're able to quantify this equilibrium, we wanna make sure we're, we understand all the different equilibrium scenarios that we can encounter. And in this case, there's two that I want you to be familiar with. So the first one is a homogeneous equilibrium. Equilibrium. Right, so homogeneous equilibrium is where there's only one phase present at equilibrium. So only one phase present at equilibrium, 
right? So when I say phase, I'm talking about, you know, the phases of matter. So if you only have gases present at equilibrium, that's a homogeneous equilibrium. If you only have aqueous solutions present at equilibrium, that's a homogeneous equilibrium. So let's look at an example of a homogeneous equilibrium and write out its expression for the, uh, for the equilibrium constant, right? So let's take this reaction. Let's say we got two CO gas plus O2 gas. These two can uh, get involved in a reversible reaction to form CO2. Right, so you got this uh, process where you got carbon monoxide gas plus oxygen gas coming together to form CO2 gas. And obviously since all of these are gases, we would only at equilibrium have one phase present, just gases. So we can write out the equilibrium constant expression here. So we got K, it's gonna be equal to, right? Starting with the products, you got CO2, the concentration of CO2 squared over the concentration of CO squared times the concentration of O2. Right, so that's going to give you the equilibrium uh, constant for this process. Let's look at another one. So let's say that we have uh, H2 gas plus CO2 gas. This can be in a reversible reaction to form carbon monoxide gas plus water vapor. So water gas, right? So again, all gases here. So again, we just have um, a homogeneous equilibrium and we can write out its equilibrium constant. So we have the concentration of CO. We got the concentration of times the concentration of H2O. And that's gonna be over the concentrations of the reactants. So you got H2, concentration of H2 and concentration of CO2. Right, so notice here that none of these species had stoichiometric coefficients in front of them, so that's why there's nothing in the exponent here. All of these exponents would come from the stoichiometric coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. Now, if, if one of our prop, uh, possible equilibrium types is homogeneous, then obviously the next type that we can have is a heterogeneous equilibrium. So that's the second type of equilibrium that we can have here, a heterogeneous equilibrium right and so a heterogeneous equilibrium is going to be the opposite of a homogeneous where in this type you have more than one phase present at equilibrium so more than one phase present at equilibrium And this is ubiquitous throughout chemistry. So one thing that's very common in chemical reactions, uh, especially in the gas phase, is to use a solid as a catalyst. So you won't just have, um, at equilibrium, you won't just have gases, you would also have um, your solid that's being used, you might produce uh, some other vapors, right? So you would have more than one phase present at equilibrium. Now, the key thing to note here is that um, when you're dealing with heterogeneous equilibrium, pure solids and pure liquids do not affect equilibrium. So let me write that out here. So pure solids and liquids do not affect equilibrium. And the reason that this is the case, right, is because the equilibrium constant, our expression for the equilibrium constant, it depends on the concentration of that species. 
pure solids and pure liquids don't have a concentration, right? If you've got pure water, it's pure water. There's no concentration that you can quantify there, right? If you've got just a pure titanium solid, there's no concentration that you can um, that you can make for a pure or you can quantify for a pure titanium solid. So those don't affect equilibrium. So if we have a case where we have a heterogeneous equilibrium, like the following case, where we'll have CaCO3 as a solid, that can produce calcium oxide solid plus CO2 gas, right? So when it decomposes, it produces carbon dioxide gas. If we were to write out the equilibrium constant for this expression, right, a, an expression for K, it would just be equal to the concentration of CO2, right? That would be it. This is the expression. The reason being because our other species are pure solids. We can't uh, uh, quantify a concentration here. We also cannot quantify a concentration there. So the only thing that would affect equilibrium is going to be the gas. Gases and aqueous solutions are going to be the only things that will affect equilibrium because they have a concentration that we can quantify. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a good introduction into the law of mass action. Um, in the next video, we're going to actually use these expressions to calculate the equilibrium constant, right? So we've set up these, uh, these expressions. And so in the next video, we're just going to go through a few examples where you can use, build up these expressions to actually calculate a number for the equilibrium constant.